Okay, Drew, I think you should be good to go. And the recording is on? Yes. Perfect. So welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the day one of IB workshop on barriers to internet access of services, also called BIAS in short. This will be a three day workshop. Uh, uh, on the agenda, on the day one, we have community networks. I'll be moderating this session. Tomorrow, we have digital divide moderated by Mallory. And on the final day, we have topics related to censorship, which will be moderated by Maria. You can find the full agenda and all the different uh, presentations on the link below, as well as shared earlier on the email. Let's have a very quick recap on what's the main scope of our workshop. This workshop aims to collect reports from various barriers to internet access and services. This could be filtering, blocking, or general inequality of technical capabilities, which could be even device and protocol limitations that we see in internet access all over the world. Uh, the aim is so that we can better understand how the internet looks in different parts of the world and how does it feel to be connected to internet from different regions, even within the same countries uh, as well. The aim is so that we could understand what it, what it actually means to be connected to internet. Does internet looks the same to all users in the world? And moreover, even if you are connected to an internet, what does it mean to have meaningful access to it? What are the minimum requirements there are so that we can say that, yes, you are meaningfully connected to the internet. You can access the content and services uh, in the same ways as other peoples in the world. Uh, you can also find the full scope and background on our uh, data tracker page as well as on the IAB web page. Let's go through a quick uh, administrative here. We have a workshop mailing list. Uh, all of you have already joined. Uh, even discussion outside of uh, the workshop, uh, the actual meeting, we would like you to use the emails to continue discussions on the papers presented today, as well as other topics related to uh, the workshop. So please use the mailing list to continue discussion. You will find all the papers available on the data tracker page. Uh, we got around 19 position papers that were submitted to the program committee, of which 10 are published uh, on the data tracker. We also invited two, in, two talks of published papers already out there, which we thought fit into our workshop agenda quite well and would help with the discussions in this workshop. After the workshop is over, we publish uh, the workshop report in form of an RFC, uh, which starts, of course, as an internet IAB internet draft. Uh, this has already been created and feel free to uh, look at the report, uh, give your PRs, review, etc. because this is very important. This is what the rest of the community uh, would look at uh, once the workshop is over and how this, what are the different things that we discussed today and what discussion that happened would be very good for our community to be aware of. The final administrative uh, point, this workshop is recorded uh, and it will be published uh, on our data tracker page as well as on our IB website. Uh, if some discussions require Chatham House rules, please let us know. So far, no, none of you have indicated that, but that option is still available based on how the discussion happens forward. Uh, we want to have a very lively discussions among the workshop participants. But please use plus Q on the WebEx chat to queue up for your questions and comments. And that covers the administrative year. Now let's move on with our day one. We have four topics uh, which are all related to community networks, which we will discuss today. The format would be that we would have 10 minutes of presentation followed by five minutes of uh, discussions related to what was presented. And we have an ample amount of time for general discussions uh, at the end of all the presentations as well. So we have kept enough time for good discussion and that's the main aim of this workshop to have more discussions rather than just have uh, a list of presentations. Uh, the first presentation that we would have is 
looking at the quest for quality, quality of service, quality of user experience in community networks that will be presented by Lewis. We have uh, a very interesting presentations which looks at what role can CDN play in community network in providing internet access and internet service uh, via CDN, which is a very interesting uh, topic and would be thought provoking as well. Then we move to the role of satellite internet in uh, in community networks, and for final we have a topic based on spectrum, six gigahertz C band spectrum and its role again in the community networks space. And we'll end with various discussions. So uh, I think we can start with our workshop with the first topic. I would also give a chance to my co-program committee if there is something that I forgot to mention and that should be covered. Please feel free to jump in. Otherwise, we'll start with the first topic today. All good. Uh, I guess I'm sharing the screen. Yes, please, Ruth. Okay. Perfect. Slide number one. Off to you. Thank you. And hi, good morning, and welcome to the workshop. The um, my name is Luis Martinez, and I will speak li brief briefly this morning about the uh, quality issues in community networks. The um, the actually now I'm connected through a community network, a urban community network in Mexico City, and the. Um, I need to do bandwidth aggregation because the practices of the uh, community network management uh, are having problems with, uh, let's say, throttling. So then the, uh, the, my experience as a user is not at all satisfactory because whenever I'm having a presentation like this in a synchronous mode, the the, the the video tends to stop. That's one of the reasons I also asked Ruth to share my uh, slides, slides because just to be sharing the same uh, experience with you. So without that introduction, if if you put the next slide, please. So in the AAB, AAB uh, workshop in 2022. This, this was a conclusion, the bandwidth is necessary, but not alone sufficient. And for many people may suffice the, that the connection is enough, no matter how good or bad is that connection from the technical point of, of view. However, at the end, every user after using a community network always tends to complain about the quality of the network. And we have to go back and look into what is the model of the community network in order, in order to understand how the, um, the quality issues may have been solved if this has been put into design before of uh, building the network. We also know a number of problems about community networks, such as maintenance and management. Why? Because there are, these are enterprises that grow organically. So, this model has limitations. It's supposed that every user may accept these limitations. And also, it has practices that are particular and singular to the, the, the communities itself, which are looking at, uh, at first to get connected into the internet. But later, they want to evolve into other services that are used by the community. Most of the services we look in Mexico are to use video. And when people come into video, things start to get um, complicated because the, the network was not well planned and designed to carry uh, large packets of video. Also, people are lacking of knowledge and experience to use other solutions such as cash in the in, in the in the network, yes, or use uh, local content the, delivery. 
Yes. So we believe the the, the um, we should research into this, get more numbers about uh, what is the user experience. But before this, we need to set a number of um, factors and a number of um, issues that we want to find out in the community networks. Yes. The um, the, this may lead to better sizing and configuration of the network. Also, the experience uh, within the the technical community of the internet has led to a number of documents with uh, many recommendations around quality of service, uh, quality of experience. Yes, and the um, although they exist in the in the technical um, domain. Yes, um, according to the principles of or the yes, the operating principles of the community networks, they need to be, let me say, translated into a more simple language that the operators of these networks, which usually do not have a lot of technical experience, may incorporate into the networks. So this means that the community at large needs to develop uh, new uh, materials to share these ideas with the current uh, networks. So it means going into best practices. Yes, and we need to find out these best practices and then agree what will be best practices. So we need um, a forum to, to share and agree these ideas and later do the um, the dissemination, the diffusion of these ideas into simpler contents that people may consult to improve the, the community networks. It seems that the connection issue is not longer an issue. It's, um, it, it is more or less solved. There is popular knowledge about how to build a, a community network and and then we need to look as natural in the evolution of the any network that it needs to go into an uh, optimized mode. Um, so, in principle, we know that community networks are, are not very different from uh, other networks. Yes, um, the funding is quite a difference, but the um, hardware and software, they may be very, very similar. Next, please. Okay, so the, um, as the, this workshop is related to the sustainable development goals, and most of the technical community was surprised not to see a specific topic on the, um, um, on the goals regarding to communication. Yes, the um, most of the effect of communications is accepted to be an important um, parameter in order of these goals. Yes, the um, we know that the United Nations and ITU they still use a number of um, measurements which are not really. Uh, the, the, a reflect of what is happening in um, in networks these days and in modern communications, if I'm allowed to say modern, yes. But the um, the idea is um, most community networks have a large impact on environmental conditions because they are based on um, very uh, optimized developments which. Uh, make very well use of resources. They lack a lot of resources. So waste, for example, is minimized. The uh, uh, lifespan of uh, equipment is stretched far most the design conditions. So th this also brings um, the sense of justice, equ equality, freedom, peace, many things that are included in the SDGs and which are related to human rights. So we also believe community networks is a appropriate and real path towards achieving, achieving other um, 
goals for 2030. Yes, the, um, as I was saying, the uh, first goal of community networks is to bring um, a connection and infrastructure to get connected to the internet. And the, um, and the nature of these uh, networks, yes, is still lacking of this user experience. Next, please. Okay, so we know most of the characteristics of the community networks. I will, I will just point out the organic growth. Organic things, when they grow, they usually grow in a bottom-up uh, approach. It means and um, we always have desire that these networks grow also in terms of knowledge and grow in terms of sustainability, uh, grow in terms of um, reach, but not always this happens. The um, a community network is hardly understand as a community enterprise. And we know that communities in general Yes, looking from the social point of view, they have a lot of problems in achieving things like cohesion and uh, understanding. So when we go into the technical side of the community, it's supposed to be the same, but it rarely happens, only there, there is a leadership in the community. And also we might think that leadership is affecting the way the community is managed, yes. So the, uh, in the long term, the community networks, they have problems of administration, management, growth, and quality, which is the point of this paper. Next, please. And the, uh, the user experience we know from all the previous research is highly dependent on the capabilities of the, of the community. Yes, and the uh, is also depending on this organic growth. Uh, users in different parts of the network uh, may experience different parts. As uh, in the beginning, in the introduction of the same, uh, of the workshop, it, it was discussing. Well, there may be different experience in different countries. It may happen as well in different parts of the network that the experience is completely different. And the, um, so uh, as this is community driven uh, deployment, the, uh, there is no guarantee for quality. Yes, uh, people, um, they pay for um, CAPEX, yes, uh, rather than OPEX. Yes, and um, OPEX is minimized. So the, um, as well, it comes problems that uh, usually do not arise in uh, commercial networks, which are the, um, the ability to uh, have um, user support. User support is community driven, is driven by knowledge, which is the, uh, one of the attractive parts of, of the networks, and we shouldn't uh, complain about that because that's the way it happens and that's the way it has happened, and we hope it will continue to happen that way. Yes, but the, uh, as I was saying at the beginning, user expectation, uh, as long as they become uh, mature users, starts to have problems around availability, band, bandwidth, and stability. Next, please. So, one of the community networks I really, really consider top of the class is uh, WIFINET in Spain, the, um, the very large uh, community network, uh, which took a lot of time, which is well managed, which has uh, a very good availability, but the, um, as they say, even in the, in their presentations about WIFINET, the, um, there are problems regarding heterogeneous, uh, services. Why? Because many of the links are community maintained. There are, um, issues on, uh, keeping the standards around the network. So if we go into the next, we will see in, uh, next please, Ruth. So, 
if we go into the network, which I don't have a picture of a big picture of the network, yes, the uh, the uh, our network is offering in the commercial part the um, easiness and uh, speed, but th they are lacking of uh, proper throttling or net neutrality policies, which always ends in a very bad experience when using video. Yes, the uh, this community network was built in part from a WISP, yes, as a wireless internet service provider. So the, um, the, the, let's say the backhaul connection of the, of the network is managed by the WISP. The rest of the network is, uh, grows around nodes in, in Mexico City. And we always have to remember the, what we expect as quality of experience, experience, which is subjective, a subjective measure of the quality as experienced by the user. Next, please. So the um, the if we look at the number of or the kind of community networks we are look uh, seeing around the world in um, in um, oops yes the um, we see community networks are all around the world every effort uh, um, done in the community networks takes a lot of time to get um, known in in many parts of the world. Uh, we recognize the work of Gaia in uh, IETF uh, about discussing these issues and bringing the uh, or sharing solutions, but we still feel that we need a, a bigger effort uh, supported by, um, for example, ISOC to to bring into the community networks more knowledge, uh, not as a, a standard by itself, but the uh, knowledge that uh, share these best, best practices. <coughs> and we also need to, or we feel we need to encourage the uh, adoption of many principles as contained in um, RFCs especially RFC 6390, yes, and the, um, when we talk about quality of experience, yes, so two things uh, may be done. One, the recognition of these subjective parameters about user experience, which are related to the net network performance, the, um, the recognition of individual and community needs, and also the the support, the establishment of um, more forums, uh, for it related to the, um, the sharing information and the uh, working towards um, a set of best best practices that can be adopted in community ne networks worldwide. So that's the end of the presentation. Thanks you. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Lewis. That was very interesting and especially the idea of sharing the best practices about uh, how to run the community network and especially looking at the manageability aspects. That was quite interesting and thanks for your presentation. If anybody has any questions, please use. Yeah, Miria, go ahead. Just out of curiosity and non-technical question, why are you connected to a community network? Well, right the, uh... I'm a believer of community networks, so the uh, that's why even if I have the chance to to use uh, fiber optic connection at home, I I still believe and I have so, sorted out many problems using the wireless community network at home, and the uh, because if you don't practice what you believe, well the uh, you're you're just making theoretical assumptions. So is that a your, your the network you said you're in Mexico City, right? Yes. So is the network you're connected to basically a test network or is that actually used uh, for certain people to connect? Sorry again, can you repeat? Uh, I didn't hear the the community well. network you're connected to right now, is that more like a test network? You're just uh, operating no, 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 for learning, uh, or okay. 
No, it's a real and working community okay. network serving okay. uh, in this node about uh, 20 connections. Okay, so that is people who cannot afford a regular internet connection, I guess, or what is the reason? Yes, the, uh, well, the advantage of the community network is more affordable because uh, the real cost for maintenance of the network is about one, uh, about 15% of the, uh, the, the commercial network provided by the cable operators. And who is operating this community network? Is that from the well, university? No, no, actually okay. it's a group of people living in the same area of the city. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Arnold, go ahead. Uh, yes. Hi, Luis. Thank you very much. Uh, Luis, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is a question for clarification because I, I could, you mentioned at some point that there were some kind of issues due to the leadership of the people managing the, the community network and I, I could not understand the, the, the points you, you made here. Okay, thank you, Arno. The, uh, well, uh, we have to look how a community network uh, is born and how it goes through the infancy, through childhood, and then it goes into uh, further uh, stages. Yes, in the beginning, there's a lot of enthusiastic people that have spotted the need of a community, a group of individuals that need to be connected to the internet, either for social or economic reasons, but there is a need. And uh, these people look around to get the uh, technical solution to the connection, the, the wireless networks and the use of uh, free spectrum to connect into, uh, well, what would be called a radio area network, a RAN, yes, or uh, Wi-Fi and um, access points and routers, uh, allow them to create the network, but if, if we start from that, many commercial networks criticize the community networks because the, um, the, they are not using top of the notch uh, solutions rather than uh, grassroots solutions. So people try to find out how to bring a connection, but forget the issues about safety. And it happens nothing until the network start to be used uh, for many purposes. So then the security and safety issues arise. So they need to learn how to build a firewall and they start digging again, how to build a firewall. But these enthusiastic people, they, they, in their nature is the enthusiasm to build community networks. So they build one network and most of the times they, they, they forget that that community networks needs to, to be standalone, yes, to be uh, capable of self-sustaining and to get resources for management and to have uh, technical practice to keep the management at uh, the best. So management starts to, um, let's say, degrade and it's given to one of the community members if we are talking about a small uh, uh, network. And the, uh, there, there is where there is no enough knowledge to have the uh, best management in the, uh, in the community and so on. <coughs> so from the commercial point of view, we will see, well, this, this uh, has a origin problem, but that's the real nature of community networks. Yes. So the um, so that's that's my view. Okay. So so then it leads to my second question, and and it's a perfect segue because uh, I heard about the safety and the security point, and you you take the approach of the quality of experience from connection is not enough, let, uh, bandwidth matters, and then management matters. And I was surprised that you have not put security as well matters in, in this story. Is this that it's not a problem at all, or is this something that you could not 
uh, address today or why is security? Because you made a very valid point on security and safety yeah. and it could be both yeah. attacking the community network or the community network being abused as a botnet member or whatever. Yeah, the, uh, well, one of the, uh, the reasons I do not put uh, security in one of these needs is that um, the community networks, they are, let's say, um, simple w without being naive, but the um, technical knowledge is not very deep inside the community networks. There are more users that are trying to sort out their connection to the internet rather than use the internet excessively for trying new stuff. Yes, if we look how the security problems arise, it arises uh, most of them or many of them, I don't want to say most, many of them from inside the network. And if these networks are pretty utilitarian and they have, a, let's say, a real purpose rather than experimental uh, features, then the uh, security is not a problem within. The problem comes when, for example, a virus arises in the community network and there is no contention procedures. Well, the uh, people do not what to do. So many of the networks get offline easily when this happens. Why? Because the only management solution they know easily is to disconnect the network and shut down everything and restart again, hoping this is going to be sorted out. That's where, where I come to the need of knowledge to, for the community, because the, um, the, 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 there are no practices and they cannot afford real uh, large scale practices. So that's a problem. Yeah, thanks, Lewis. Thanks a lot. We still have two questions. Maybe we can do them very, very briefly. Mallory, go ahead. Hi, thanks, Luis. I really want to appreciate your presentation to open up the whole week because I think it gives a really broad overview of um, an important topic when we're talking about access. I wanted to like reflect. I've known GiphyNet for a long time. Um, one realization I had at some point years ago was one of their major innovations was actually their their billing system <laughs> because um, you know it is actually individual people like you know farmers and you know just individual folks who get paid for their infrastructure and for sharing it with their neighbors and so the billing comes in when you know folks are getting they get credits from the system for the work and the the infrastructure and the time they put in to it. Um, and then they, and then that offsets their cost of connectivity. And the way that that's done is actually really amazing and it's allowed it to scale. Um, and I, I bring this up because it made me um, reflect on, I, I grew up in the Midwest United States um, and we still have to this day in the US quite a lot of uh, cooperatives that deliver utilities like electrical, uh, power and things and um, you know those are now because they were really critical to getting places where like where I lived on the grid for electricity right you had to get the farmers themselves involved in electrifying their homes um, you know you you were there was a requirement to actually use these sort of cooperative methods they're a lot more socialist than really large companies of course um, but that I think because it wasn't as well supported is actually the plan of uh, the United States to kind of like connect everyone to the internet in the same way that it connected to, to the electrical grid. Um, we don't see that same thing. So I, I guess this is a long way of just asking a comment. Today we have a lot of uh, like cooperative uh, industry associations. There's the NRECA for um, the electric cooperatives in the United States. Do you know of any kind of like cooperative industry association for community networks that has sort of this, you know, bargaining power, um, sort of regulatory um, lobbying and that sort of thing that's springing up? Well, the, um, no, 
really i don't know about uh, an association the um, the um the, the, of course there are associations uh we have um Jankoflin around the uh, the participants and the um the but local in the US i don't know i can tell you about a network in um in uh, san diego which the network starts in San Diego and finishes in Ensenada, Mexico. And it's based on these um, uh, uh, hubs around the houses of the uh, uh, members of the network in the same sense as WiFiNet, but the, uh, in a very, very small, small scale. Also, we have to think that the um, model of community networks do, does not really appeals to an organization for lobbying or for centralism or any other, uh, let's say, political practice that may bring the uh, um, a lot of networks together into a federation. Yes, and I'm not sure it, w it, it is um, really appropriate a federated model for community networks. Uh, I still believe a lot on the organic mode of the networks and how they should grow and maybe be friends of the next network, but not really partners of the next network. Uh, thanks. Uh, we have last question, David, and can we just make it a little uh, quick because we are over time now? David, go ahead. Oh, very interesting topic. Uh, very quick. Are you aware of use cases where community networks power indigenous communities? Yes, a lot. And actually, in Mexico, we have built uh, many networks in indigenous communities, uh, which is one of the stereotypes that usually come with community networks, which is connections for poor people and uh, unprepared people, but uneducated people, but actually it can be anything. Uh, as I was saying, I'm in a urban community network, uh, which also we find in New York. And of course, we have community networks in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the jungle of the uh, Chiapas, which I have been there and provided a lot of solutions. Many come from uh, uh, grassroots solutions, instead of using uh, metal structures, they use bamboo or wood for uh, keeping the antennas at very good height. So yes, there's a number. If you take a look, a look at ISOC's um, community networks map, you will find uh, a lot of uh, examples of that um, in, in Africa and, um, and also in Asia. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, that was very good presentation and a good discussion. Let's move on to the second uh, topic, which is Marwan talking about how to use uh, and can CDN play a role in community networks. So after you, Marwan. Marwan, we can't hear you if you are speaking. Sorry, thank you, Drew. Um, yes, so I'm going to um, first, Luis. That was fabulous. Uh, the points are brilliant. Having been on on that side of the fence, um, uh, many of the ideas are also familiar. I, I'm going to try and um, run through this. Maybe recover a little bit of time. I'm, I'm anticipating there might be questions or comments. The bulk of this was actually previously presented at an IRTF um, at IETF 111, um, but but. but the the sort of the thinking has has advanced a little bit, and and I'm happy to share some of those if those, if those questions come up. And 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 personally, on a personal level, thinking selfishly, I think the perhaps even the more interesting aspects of this are what may lie ahead uh, if we're willing to think about them. Um, and by the way, Theo, I, I don't believe he was able to join us in the end today. He's been spending a lot of work looking a lot of time thinking about interconnection, um, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, and has an interest in some of these things as well. Okay, so um, just to sort of uh, set the stage, 
um, it, some of these ideas are, are not going to be new to anybody. Uh, internet services are inaccessible to to CN. And and when I say here internet services, generally we think of these things as transit. But as we start to imagine things like billing and security in some form and all of the rest, it it, it tends to be much more than just sending bits to and from routing bits to and from the internet. So I'll often use this sort of label for lack of a better one. Um, the thing is is not to suggest that these are easy things, but there's plenty of evidence around the planet, as we've just heard from Luis and, and in the chat channel, that communities can do quite a lot. They can design and deploy their own local infrastructure consisting of all kinds of hardware and, and, and medium. Um, they, they, of course, once they do that, there needs to be some notion of backhaul to an exchange um, or an internet connection point. Um, oftentimes this happens via libraries and schools. I think Jane wrote that out. Sometimes it's, if you're lucky, the national research and educational networks in general, publicly funded infrastructure sometimes plays a role. Um, but, but at the end of the day, a lot of times this can very well be within communities control or influence. Um, I was previously involved in hubs. Uh, and, and that was a cooperative of community networks as a way to sort of aggregate the demand so, so that we could um, establish our own backhaul. But, but the trick here is this notion of the internet services themselves and the cost. So, so routing to and from the open internet, most often this is coupled uh, with backhaul, but there's no need that it should have to be a requirement. So in the slides for later reference, I put in a, a few different models of how sort of backhaul and internet services are set up when community networks are, are, um, are deployed. We can come back to this if necessary, but the slides are there uh, and some references as well to expand. So coming back to this notion of, of, of what community networks can do, I'm gonna point out in the first two cases, Lots of evidence to show how this is done, not to suggest it's a completely solved problem, but at least gives us a way forward. This last one, though, the Internet services, uh, I'm going to remark that the pricing for this is very much outside of the control of the community networks. And, and crucially, if it's available at all, if it's available at all as a caveat throughout this presentation. Um, uh, and the pricing is, is generally, it's prohibitively expensive because it's de designed around economies of scale that just don't exist in a lot of places where community networks deploy. So let me pause here and observe that, that CDNs in many forms, they're not internet service providers. I think we're, we're all okay with that idea, but they are very well connected networks in some form. And, and there's this little caveat here that says, typically relative to the scale of the service, whether it's regional or national or, or international and so on. And so this kind of begs the question is what might CDNs and non-ISP networks contribute to community networks in general? And, and crucially, the reasons they should want to do so. Now, I'm gonna pause here and say, um, a lot of this is informed by an actual running deployment of this type of thing today. Uh, and it's been going on now, I think for at least 18 months now, maybe pushing two years. So this can be made to work. So I'm going to observe here, um, CDNs and these non-ISP networks generally have the facilities and the features to start with. So if we think internally, they route data within the infrastructure all over the place, and they probably run additional services related to, you know, content and caching, or security, or both. Uh, externally too, because we say, well, they're not ISPs, but the truth is they have to connect to the rest of the internet. Um, they, they typically will have reliable and high quality connectivity uh, out to the wide internet. Um, and they announce reachable address ranges via BGP. Um, and this applies, of course, again, equally irrespective of size or maybe relative to size. Um, and so they're kind of already there set up to do it one would think. Uh, there's another piece here, by the way, which is we think of CDNs as sort of only being these ingress, they only set up to receive, but imagine CDNs have to be set up as well to initiate connections out to the wider world, oftentimes to provide services either internally or as part of some sort of some product suite. So, so technically the foundations already exist. But then the question is, why would any CDN do this? And I claim the incentives uh, to work with CDNs are actually much more aligned than they are with ISPs. So let's talk about just the service costs in general. Well, if you're a large CDN, and we talk about the additional bandwidth requirements in order to serve community networks out of the CDN, um, 
I'd claim you're unlikely to feel the additional uh, traffic that's generated. So in the existing deployment that's out today, I believe the model is uh, five gigabits, um, uh, 95th percentile is at no cost is the, is the offering from this particular CDN. Um, again, incentives, and we'll cover those. But even if you're a small CDN, you could say, well, the community network's going to join, generate so much additional load and traffic that is going to increase my costs. But at the same time, consider that that actually might be a selling point because the greater the, the, the load, um, the better the negotiating position to get the better rates overall for everybody, okay? Of course, there's this notion from a CDN's perspective, the paying customers, the, 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 the domain name owners and so on, um, well, their customers are going to be happy. So you generating more connections on the network, which is a larger audience, and so you get happier customers in the end. I have no evidence to suggest that this is true, but anecdotally, the more people on the internet, then the, the better the customers, the more, the more uh, connections they receive. One could argue it, there may be a side effect for a lot of the customers as well of the CDNs, which it reduces their onward costs. So if you're a provider of service, public service, for example, uh, you run a customer service line, you have to pay people to answer the phone or open envelopes and reply to letters. But if there's more of the, of the service happening online, then that means there are um, fewer people who have to be employed. So maybe it reduces some of those costs. I'm not the expert in this domain, um, but I'm happy to make this claim. So then what about charging models? And I know a lot of questions come up around here. I would say that there are all reasons to charge no more than cost. Um, and, and, and for the reasons I've described above, but even if there is some expense, because this isn't no cost for the CDNs, let's be honest, uh, if there's one, uh, uh, in addition to the no cost model or the no more cut than cost model, one could consider this from the corporate perspective, sort of the corporate social responsibility. I know the United Nations is big on these things. There's wiki pages devoted to them. Um, and so it's not hard to chalk up any additional expense to uh, w within this bucket. So if I come back to the challenges from experience, there are some things uh, that are worth pointing out if we think about this because the world is not all roses. Um, and, and so there are a couple of things that uh, do require some thought and energy. The first is this notion of decoupling the actual backhaul, moving bits from the community network, let's say to the, to the exchange point or to the data center. Uh, so decoupling the backhaul from the transit-like service itself. Most often these two things are attached together, but fundamentally there's no reason that they should be because one is at layer two and the other one's at layer three. Um, it still leaves backhaul as an open problem. So uh, either somebody has to lay fiber or mount antennas. Sometimes you need to get special permission to do that. The owner of the building uh, where the CDN is, is running is often not, does not belong to the CDN. So sometimes there are these complications. But to be honest, they might not be so different from many of the problems that exist today when it comes to deploying infrastructure. Um, IPv4 address space turns out to be non-trivial. So if the community network comes along and doesn't already have IPv4 space, we believe that it is still necessary, and let's be honest, it is in some cases. Um, this can be problematic. Okay. Um, and then within the CDN itself, incentivizing and accounting for people's time and resources does require some thought and energy. So in the existing deployment, I know internally as part of the corporate social responsibility program. And so there is this ongoing effort every now and then just to educate people who work at the company that this is one of many such programs um, and, and it's good for the world if people volunteer some of their time within their working hours. Of course, no one is going above and beyond, but from an accounting perspective, it's important for the, for the, um, for the CDN to be able to account for this. Uh, so. Looking ahead, what about questions um, questions around models of service delivery? And, and a few come up, um, all related to sort of notions of information dissemination, knowledge sharing, management, and so on. So first is, does the IETF or some similar organization decide some form of, of interfaces or best practices in order to facilitate deploying this in the future? Um, CDNs, I believe they try really hard to use open standards, but they may not. Uh, perhaps there's space for some new specification that helps uh, make this just a little bit easier as people decide to roll this out. Commercial interests, again, um, we talked about large CDNs. Remember the happier customers and the small CDNs, of course, uh, hopefully better negotiating position. 
Um, but I think actually one of the more interesting questions to think about is, is whether there's space for community and cooperative models to extend to the CDN space itself. Um, we see, for example, all kinds of connections that, that in, are initiated and terminated. Um, it, let's say Africa is a great example. There's plenty of evidence to show this. Clients that are in Africa wanting to retrieve African contents and services oftentimes have to go through one of the large European IXPs. Um, well, that seems a bit silly. And so one wonders is maybe in a place where the dominant service delivery model for access is community and cooperatives, maybe there's a space to initiate a CDN in the same region, and then you get the dual model. So I claim CDNs are well connected and I'm in a good position to do this. The incentives with CDNs uh, align much more naturally. Uh, the, the, there are no more than cost charging models available. Um, and of course, then the onward question is, is there space for community or cooperative in this space? And I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thank you, Marwan. That was an excellent presentation, thought provoking. Uh, uh, are there any questions? Please queue up. One that I can ask while we wait for other folks is, uh, I saw that Cloudflare is also doing this. There's the Pangea stuff. So can you share some information about how many uh, community networks are joining this? What is the feedback? What's happening in that space? Yes. Um, so I, I was unable to get the latest numbers. Uh, I, I think it, it, one, this is one of those things that depends on perspective. So remember that uh, the backhaul is still problematic. Um, there, there are a few signups. I think we're into double digits. So it's not a huge number, but it is growing and interest continues to, to come in um, two or three new expressions of interest every month or so, I believe. Um, the reason I raised the volunteer question internally is actually this is one of the this is one of the bigger bottlenecks for Cloudflare and the Pangea program. So Cloudflare runs a few of these uh, corporate social good, uh, Galileo, um, Athenian for uh, at risk services online, and so um, the demand collectively for these types of programs actually outweighs the volunteering effort. And we've just started, we've decided we have to go through another round of educating people to say, hey, we do these things. It would be great if you can volunteer some of that time, which is permitted within your normal working day. Um, it, 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 the expressions of interest don't always turn out. They don't always deploy, again, because of uh, technical ability um, on the community network side. Um, but for the people that do get connected, the feedback so so far has been rather po has been entirely positive. Thanks, Bhavan. Uh, Mallory, go ahead with your questions. Thanks. Um, I guess I'm thinking about a lot of networks we've mentioned. There's a you know there's a diversity of community networks. Um, I just want to acknowledge that. I think Jane pointed that out uh, really clearly in the chat. Um, and sometimes, right, you get maybe the reason or the motivation for a community network being all about, you know, self ownership and just a real commitment to ensuring like the technology stack is just fully owned by people. That's like a political socioeconomic choice. And I, so I, I wonder, there's always going to be these corner cases where, you know, partnership with a large corporate, even upstream, like a, um, content delivery network is just not going to be an option for people. So I wonder if there's like an, uh, an understanding of what the constituent parts of what a CDN does are um, such that that's then something that, you know, the community can start to own. And it's kind of, you know, the last slide you have, right? Is a community CDN possible? Does it make sense? Um, but I guess then there's this open question, like, what is it essentially going to do if we can't rely on it to have the benefit of economies at scale because of corporate, you know, um, uh, backing? So maybe just a thought experiment. Uh, so I, wow, there's a lot to unpack there and, and I really want to do this. So let me, I may have misunderstood. Um, I think, one thing I'm comfortable saying is that this is a valid concern and, and there are people who have come to Cloudflare and said, look, I, I, this is really fabulous. Um, it's, 
I, I don't, there are no affordable options without this, but at the same time, how much control do I relinquish in a sense? Like, how does it affect um, w w what I can configure? Um, what's true is that is limited by the configuration plane that, that uh, in this case, Cloudflare already offers. So, um, the, again, I suppose, depending on the perspective is there are a great number of configuration options, um, that, that match what current, the current customer offering, uh, but nothing beyond that. So, for example, um, you would get things like the DDoS protection and some firewall services and, um, of course, the, the pass through the back and forth, the routing to and from the internet. And, and there are pe some people who just like, I just want my bits to go back and forth and I want to handle everything else. But unfortunately that facility is not available to them. Um, I think some of these conversations are the reason that I started to wonder is, would there be a place for a community cooperative CDN? Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I honestly, I, I, it's something that, that I'd like to think about. But that setup is, um, I think it requires more thought and more people than, than just me, certainly. Um, and who would it serve? And, and is it worth running? My hope is it wouldn't be something like a village type CDN. It would be something that might have some public support, uh, especially where there's a lot of developing infrastructure um, and, and apply for some sort of regional coverage. Thanks, Bhavan. Arnold, you can go ahead with your question. Keep it brief. Uh, yes, thank you. Pleased to meet you, Marwan, finally. Uh, Marwan, I, I have two issues with your proposal. Uh, the, the first is, I, I'm, I'm in a big corporate and, uh, <laughs> you know, when you try to go for uh, uh, corporate responsibility, it's all good and, and I really like the intention, really like it, but you will have uh, laggards people in the company saying, but what's the story and what's the budget and why this and why that? And, and give me the, for example, I think you would end up in another problem, which is there are potentially many CNs in the world and on the which criteria shall I accept some as part of that program or not? And now you have to, to make some arbitrary decisions. So, that's one issue, and, and I will go for the second one after that, if you can address this one. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think just to, to make sure that everyone's on the same page here, I think you're asking is, is somebody comes along and says, I, I would like to benefit from, from this program, um, but, then, but then someone has to make a judgment about whether that entity that comes to you is eligible or not based on how they might be set up legally, what the revenue might be, if they have some position in society and the, you know, they, I don't know, some creed or something that they like to promote. Um, this is, uh, so I know for the other programs, there are a, an association of third parties that help make this decision. And I guess this is how, not being the expert, but this is how a lot of, of corporations uh, deal with this issue is they find people who are trusted and then ask them to participate in the decision-making process. Um, with the Pangea program at Cloudflare, it, it's a case by case basis, uh, but the, the 2 things that stand out are um, your some form typically of not for profit. Uh, I suspect that there might be consideration for exceptions, depending on the bigger criteria, which is the reason you exist is very much for the community's benefit. So. If it's somebody who has a small ISP startup and it's and it's clear that they've launched this as a as a, their own little for profit exercise and they want to grow and so on and so forth, they would likely not be admitted to a program like this. Mm -hmm. Got it. And so the, the second question as is another angle is about the uh, quote unquote open source uh, CDN approach. The issue I, I have here isn't of course open source is good. That's not the point. The problem is more where is the hardware, where is the connection? Because I think you can be as as much of open source as you want. The real point of the CDN, from my point of view, is the infrastructure behind it. And so, if, if you don't have that, what's the benefit then for the CN? I, I'm thinking about Africa because I spent quite some time in Africa, and and I was amazed when I realized the throttling issues, the 
the access to the submarine cables and why is it that they were slicing this and and the ISPs had to struggle all that to congestion the traffic on design to to get the money out of it blah 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 blah. I mean it was shocking but it was quite a fun experience. So I'm I'm asking how can you overcome that? I mean or maybe you can't. Uh, on on that one, I wish I had great answers for you. I mean, Theo here as well. He, I mean, the, the, he's been spending a lot of time in Africa, and even for CDN-like services, a lot of these tend not to exist in their own infrastructure. Right? They have to take uh, machines and boxes and put them into into existing networks um, because this turns out to be so hard to do. Um, Look, I, I'm happy to add that one to the caveats list of things that we need to think about. The infrastructure does matter. My 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 hope is is if we're thinking about infrastructure that's dual purpose, it suddenly becomes it well not so it hopefully becomes easier to deploy or to convince people to write the policies to support it. Okay. Thanks, Marwan. Thanks a lot for your questions. Let's move on to our next presentation, which is Peng talking about the role of satellite internet in community networks. Off to you. Uh, Peng, you are muted. Thank you so much. It's, uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to talk about uh, the satellite internet that could be used for um, our community network. So satellite internet I'm talking about here is actually represented by the uh, uh, the Leo satellites, and especially in the mega constellations we have seen from the commercial constellations uh, from Sterling, from uh, Amazon Kuiper, Telesat, Lightspeed, and OneWeb, so on and so forth. And there are going to be more of them. So to take a look at our internet usage right now, from the latest stats from ITU, we have grown a good number of internet users, and we still have, a, you know, a fair number of uh, people that are not connected due to a different reasons. And our goal is to connect the uh, to connect those unconnected with the uh, different kind of technologies that are aligned with the related device associated to the digital divide, including urban rural divide, income divide, so on and so forth. Those divides are identified from the Global Connectivity Report 2022, and the related documents actually refer to uh, affordability, equity, and inclusion that we should consider while we're bridging the digital divide. Especially if you're using satellite internet, uh, it has a lot of great promises enabled by Leo satellites. And uh, it's promised to provide very high quality internet to everyone on earth, closing the urban rural connectivity gap as an important gap uh, towards the urban rural divide and being an important part of our future telecommunications infrastructure. However, uh, we should also realize the digital divide can hardly be closed by only providing connectivity to those rural and remote areas without considering the access, equity, and affordability uh, towards the following gaps we have seen from here. And for the internet, uh, satellite internet itself, it has uh, a number of technical challenges to be solved. For example, the satellite internet connections are susceptible to atmospheric conditions and the uh, satellite networks have high dynamics in link conditions, movements, uh, computation, or traffic demands, etc. And is um, in high heterogeneity in platforms, playloads, configurations, and segments of the networks, and also resources. And also the short design lifetime of those small Leo satellites uh, that usually raised concern of sus sustainability for space environments. And also the additional links, if you are considering satellite to be part or to be um, integrated with our terrestrial telecommunications infrastructure, we're actually uh, adding the uh, uh, additional links that could uh, you know, attract some attacks uh, to this internet infrastructure. 
So uh, as many places of the world, uh, satellites have been used in uh, Canada in rural and remote communities over the years, as is shown in this map, where satellite dependent communities uh, here uh, defined as communities without terrestrial based telecom facilities or connection to the internet for connection to the internet and they rely on satellite transport to receive one or more telecom services. But going forward with the expansion project of te terrestrial telecom that works into the rural and the remote communities uh, that are happening for the rest parts of the world, satellite dependent community networks will be transformed into satellite integrated community networks. So our question is how to address the uh, the demands from those satellite integrated community networks going forward. So because providing connectivity is not enough, we have to think about some of the gaps beyond connectivity. So we have to uh, revise our goal for uh, providing internet service to everyone, for to community users from providing uh, just broadband services to providing equitable, high quality, and all, also affordable services to those community users. And the first, uh, so there are different challenges associated to that. Uh, I refer to them as performance gap and management gaps right here. So I wanna talk about performance gap, uh, which is considered as inconsistent end-to-end -end performance among satellite internet users including those in rural remote areas and especially in Canada as a representative country because we have a, a vast landscape having lots of geographically distributed communities and community network setups around uh, different places. And we also consider, uh, we also have a lot of users in northern and Arctic regions. Uh, so we need to, uh, we can consider some of the performance we have and what's the gaps shown in the real uh, world tests for Canadian community networks. So if you take a look at actual test results in geographical tiles, uh, we, uh, as reported from the OCLAS Open Data Initiative project, we can see the high variance of performance values across regions using the um, fixed and the mobile networks connections for those uh, community users. And in the Northern area, the latency performance can be easily over 200 milliseconds. And for mobile network, it can be over 500 milliseconds. Uh, but we can see that the uh, broadband or high-speed internet uh, defined by uh, CRTC uh, in Canada here, as uh, the users should have the internet connection at 50 10 megabits per second for downloads and uploads, we can see that it can almost uh, meet those uh, high speed internet speeds we want. However, the latency is the issue considering the uh, available connections. And if you take a look at the Starlink uh, performance results, just from their availability map available to everyone, uh, from the data recently and also the data accessed uh, from time to time, we can see that satellite internet can have actually the potential of providing such high-speed internet connection to everyone, including the northern and Arctic regions in Canada and across different uh, region, uh, regional users. But there's a still noticeable variance in regional latency performance, which is also aligned with the recent management study for Starlink. And this latency performance variance uh, is usually caused by some technical uh, you know, issues or factors regarding the dynamic nature of the LEO satellites and links subject to a variety of factors, including atmospheric conditions, including some of the operations and also the routing schemes and so on and so forth. And the second uh, gap is the management gap. 
because of the transformation from the satellite dependent community networks into the satellite in integrated community networks, um, we should realize the new demands from those SICNs where they need a more autonomous uh, and more consistent end-to-end -end performance and also uh, the efficient way of uh, addressing different kinds of uh, issues that may arise from the community networks using the satellites or using the satellite as one of the important connectivity options they have. And usually the community networks are uh, requiring some very uh, are self-managed, so they require responsive and cost-effective management and operation solutions. These if we can address this gap, we can actually also meet the affordability um, and equity uh, factors we're considering to provide through the satellite internet. So there are different, there are many approaches existing. However, I wanted to focus on a few approaches based on our recent publications where you can see from uh, the paper, uh, the latest version of the paper uploaded. Uh, to our workshop website. But the first approach can be uh, collectively considered as deploying terrestrial network entities, especially we're considering the satellite pops uh, uh, together with edge, edge uh, data center and also IXPs. As we have known that IXPs are very useful for, for providing resilient and faster uh, internet connections to uh, users and also uh, because of the addition of uh, the satellite uh, grant facilities, if we uh, how to design the satellite pops close or within the communities is a uh, uh, is a question. But if we can do that very uh, well, it's uh, con it's considered as a way to enhance the affordability, reliability, and equity of internet access. And there. Are different research directions and one of the research direction would be uh, the optimal deployment of uh, one or a combination of those terrestrial network entities on a satellite internet. And also another one is uh, the uh, how to use those entities to guarantee the performance as we require for equitable performance guarantees across different uh, regional users. And one of the um, example we can learn from is regarding the edge data centers uh, is from the uh, AWS local zones, although most of the deployments uh, of the AWS local zones are across the metropolitan areas, but uh, so that's exactly the research direction to uh, design and deploy the similar edge data centers in general, so that we can provide some local compute storage and, and network services closer to the communities. Um, and another approach I want to talk about is called multi-layer satellite networking. And LEO satellites, because once they are deployed, are physically settled into orbital shells. On the right-hand side, you can see those examples of orbital shells, and there are going to be a lot of them in the future going forward. But basically, we can view them as uh, some basic layers. Here, multi-layer satellite networking is considered as a general approach to satellite engine networking based on orbital shells and conceptual layers built upon that, which can support performance-aware data transmission, intelligence space, infrastructure, and relay networks, efficient resource management, and so on and so forth. Basically, we're talking about uh, the satellite engine networking based on the space components. An adoption of the layers concept can help achieve the, the abstraction across the dynamic inter and intra orbital constellations of satellites operated by one or more providers. Uh, these will bring different, lots of different kinds of research topics in different directions. So those uh, listed here are just examples. And another approach I want to talk about is the autonomous maintenance. Uh, although 
we sh we have some similar terms and and uh, and uh, self management uh, you know discussions uh, existing through our ISOCs or IETF and also other standardization bodies. And here the autonomous maintenance is specifically uh, proposed to provide autonomous solutions uh, to close the management gap and providing uninterrupted internet access, in particular for the users in remote and er uh, rural areas. And in general, autonomous maintenance solutions can help ensure resilience and remove barriers preventing those users from accessing equitable and high quality and also affordable internet connections. So uh, one research direction is exploring the solutions to anomaly identification and mitigation for different scenarios in satellite integrated community networks with the consideration of space, aerial, and the ground entities. So the aerial entities includes the high altitude platform stations and the low altitude platform stations, including UAVs. So those are just example scenarios based on uh, our recent research results. And that will lead to one of the research directions for designing efficient anomaly identification and mitigation methods, uh, and also how to use data-driven approach to do the root cause analysis on the LEO satellite networks in general for our satellite internet, and also uh, the generation of high quality open data sets for supporting those autonomous intelligent solutions based on the machine learning or artificial intelligence uh, are much needed as well. And another approach I wanna talk about is called non-terrestrial network integrated networking, NTNIN, which uh, is approach to integrating NTN entities with TN entities that can help with performance guarantees management and operations activities. This approach is aligned with the ongoing convergence of satellite and the terrestrial networks standard uh, made by 3GPP and other organizations with the consideration of space, aerial, and the ground entities. Uh, various topics need to be explored, including the optimal placement of ground infrastructure uh, as the ones we are considering for consistent end-to-end -end performance. And also, if we consider the software-defined networking uh, um, method, uh, and we should consider some related research topics re uh, regarding joint controller uh, and gateway placement, uh, taking those LEO satellites as new space nodes, and also uh, some flow to setup, time minimization, et cetera. And there's also a lot of additional radio and network resource uh, available on the new satellite network. Um, so we need to come up with the, the good resource management methods for those. And uh, because of the importance of the radio ac access network um, for beyond 5G and the 6G, where the satellites will be an important part of, of we need to consider uh, how to incorporate NTN into the radio access network, especially the open RAN architecture, which can provide potential solutions to close the management gap um, with the architecture design, functional split optimization, and also some resource management and also data-driven approach using AI and machine learning. Those are the active research problems to solve. And also related to that, related to the NTN integrated networking architecture, we're actually enabling new digital services because we have more nodes and some of those can play uh, the role as uh, the Internet of Things nodes, uh, which can provide some sensing and sensing and actuation capabilities on the aero or space components. These will unlock a lot of different uh, new digital services that we can provide for those um, rural and remote uh, communities and also allowing us to deploy the new 
uh, the existing services that could be covered uh, uh, for those community users. So this suggests an imp important the research direction aligned with the NTNIN approach. In conclusion, the advanced satellite internet can help close the key urban rural divides, but we must resolve the important performance and management gaps uh, in order to close the digital divide. And there's much room for improvements in order to provide truly equitable, affordable, ubiquitous internet for everyone, unlocking a whole range of new digital services for them. On our way of implementing or accelerating the implementation of sustainable development goals for uh, uh, of the United Nations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Thanks for sharing your research. This was very, very interesting. Uh, I don't see any questions, so let's move ahead to. Uh, oh, we have one question. Go ahead, Jen. Uh, Jane. Keep yeah, it sorry. brief. And um, keep it brief for clarifying questions. Thank you. It's uh, it's right there in the chat. I really don't have to say much other than wonderful presentation, Peng, who really really nice. I've heard that um, IXPN, which is the Nigerian IXP, the largest one in Lagos, Abuja, and some other places, is peering with Starlink. And that seems to be a really interesting trend to me where you can get better um, interconnection and diversification of um, players at the IX. Have you heard of any other places or seen where Starlink might be peering in um, Sub-Saharan? Yeah, thanks very much for, for your comments. And as um... It's great to hear that we have actual, uh, you know, community networks are appearing with the Starlink. As far as I know, uh, the just, uh, you know, a lot of uh, internet service providers are having the contract or uh, planning to have the contract with uh, the considering of the satellite internet. It has been ha happening uh, since the, the recent years, since last year or 2022. So we would expect more to happen. So that's exactly, I think, the proposed kind of uh, paradigm of satellite integrated community networks can can help, uh, you know, to address some of the um, uh, research issues that may come arising from the uh, from those kind of uh, trend. Thanks, but uh, not. Yes, sorry for the, for the lag. Uh, uh, yes, Peng, my, my question for clarification concerns your slide 14 uh, when you speak about efficient anomaly identification. Do, does it include security or is it just about management? It is including security as well. Because nowadays um, there are different kinds of anomalies that could happen based on onboard anomalies, based on external attacks. So uh, I think security and resilience uh, should be combined to be considered. Thank you. Thanks, Fang. Thank you. So let's move to our last talk, which is uh, related on uh, the role of spectrum and especially six gigahertz spectrum and what role it will play in the community networks. So Peng, could you stop sharing, please? And Raquel, uh, go ahead and share your presentation. Yes, please go ahead. You are muted in case you're speaking. Raquel, we don't hear you, you are muted. I'm sorry, my computer is a bit slow. <laughs> Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I think that uh, many of the, the topics that I was planning to talk about were in a way um, discussed um, by some of the previous uh, presenters. I 
think that I can change a little bit the focus of what I was uh, planning to talk about because you have the paper anyway. And uh, I think that since the my profile in terms of uh, what I do uh, specifically with my work at uh, the ITU, it's it's a bit different from the profile of the other presenters here, and maybe it would be more interesting instead of just uh, focusing on what's going on in the ITU, etc. There will be more interesting for um, a civil society audience. Then I should maybe change it a little bit and focus more on what is my role there. No, because I think that you're kind of familiar with um, the dynamics uh, of. Uh, spectrum uh, definition and the spectrum discussions, especially within the ITUR. Um, I work for um, an NGO called Article 19 that focuses on on um, freedom of expression issues in general, including connectivity. And um, during the WRC, you no, know, the last conference uh, where the radio regulations are updated. Uh, it happens every three and a half, four years. Um, it happened last time uh, between the 20th and the 16th, uh, 20th of November, 16th of December in Dubai last year. So there were uh, very interesting developments and interesting discussions. And the focus here, since the focus is community networks and uh, universal connectivity, um, was uh, the discussion focusing on the six gigahertz, which was par a part of the the C band? You know, the whole C band was was, or at least a, a, a huge part of the C band, depending on how you define the C band, was discussed there, um, especially for region two. But the discussion became uh, bigger than that during the WRC. You no, know? so basically. Um, why uh, was that a topic that was important? It's because it was the since uh, the last World Mobile uh, Conference, um, it was the focus of the industry, the IMT industry, to have this uh, frequency band for the 5G, especially. No, different kinds of, of usage within the 5G and, and, and some of the promises of the 6G, the next generation. And uh, this band is being used in many areas for Wi Fi communication, which is basically composed of smaller uh, and diverse industry that are not normally represented in the ITD. Actually, during the WRC, there were some association of small ISPs, commercial ISPs, and 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 small companies who uh, pose uh, area of, um, of uh, basically their target uh, Wi-Fi Wi-Fi industry, but they are not very much represented there. Uh, as you know, the ITU has this kind of. Um, um, well, a structure that it's uh, only member states may vote, and then you have a very important presence of uh, the industry, and in some cases, smaller um, countries, and sometimes not so small, because you could see that in the case of Finland, you have the industry being the main uh, voice, being the representing the country. You know? So we had lots of these um, industry interests there especially in terms of the, the, the six gigahertz discussion. And uh, that was a problem for us because we are trying to fight for a more balanced approach in terms of having spectrum that is both uh, offered in licensed and unlicensed uh, ways. No, And uh, well, there were uh, interesting um, developments in terms of how some technical discussions uh, end up being marketing discussions and uh, with lots of geo um, political uh, interests as well. So, of course, community networks was not a, an interest uh, or was not a voice that was present there. Uh, neither was the, 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 the smaller ISPs. No, so this for us was something uh, that was uh, interesting to see. 
the IMT uh, industry it's aiming for more and more spectrum. So so the six gigahertz is not something specific. No, it was just something that took more um, of the time there. But it will be other frequencies. It will be greater part of the six gigahertz in the next WRC for sure, and will be other aspects. No, so it is something that you see uh, in the corridors. People commenting how the IMT industry wants to get as much spectrum as they want. And why is this uh, relevant for us? Uh, this is relevant because it becomes um, um, a competition issue uh, because it basically has the spectrum available for one kind of technology. And even if, this, uh, if there is some sharing uh, sometimes there, there are some technical uh, issues of sharing this technology with other technologies and in uh, commercial terms is also uh, might be difficult because you have this kind of a bottleneck you know, where one industry is responsible for um, reselling part of the, the, the spectrums to other to other industries. You no. Know? So basically we understood that um, the discussion that was happening uh, with uh, within the, the, the UN and the SDGs was not sufficient because we end up having a very binary understanding of what is universal connectivity in a way that basically we saw that, uh, well, what we have there is that any connectivity is good connectivity. And we don't think that it's quite the case. Uh, Coming from uh, the global majority, we see that content, it's a very important issue, no? Uh, and that's why we uh, think that what community networks in general offer, it's very relevant because um, we know that many countries are kind of uh, depending on the zero rating, no? Uh, Brazil, it's one of those, but other countries in Latin America as well. and that's basically give you zero you know, uh, control in terms of what are you accessing. And at the same time, it gives you, uh, just like the colleague from Mexico mentioned, it, it, it kind of tends to give um, uh, a wrong understanding of how many people are connected or have access to, to the internet. Because, um, well, in, during the last year, we know that people in the zero rated countries have access to the data package for around one week and the, the rest of the, the the weeks of the month, like two to three weeks of the month, they were basically using zero rated apps, which is basically WhatsApp in the case of, of Latin America. So, but still they are, they are counted as connected people. So this for us is a problem because uh, the more you have uh, one kind of industry concentrating the offer and concentrating the what they offer in terms of connectivity, which in the ITU, especially in terms of spectrum, is only mentioned in terms of there will be more people connected. But when we go and say, but how are they going to be connected? Uh, then we start to, to see problems, no? So basically, I'll just try to make it uh, very quick because it's uh, this presentation, it's like a position paper. It's not a research paper. and so we are not presenting any kind of data. We're just trying to to open uh, the floor for questions. No, in terms of uh, how are we gonna work together with the industry? We managed to do it. Uh, with at least we start to do it that in the, during the WRC because not all industry is um, the IMT industry. Also, the broadcast industry is, is interested in is in keeping you no know, the broadcasting. Um, format of how they share information and not have it under some business model where in some places you have to pay uh, for each data that you access. No? And there are, of course, impl direct implications in terms of uh, media freedom and freedom of expression, of course, and tech diversity. And of course, uh, as I mentioned first, a matter of just market competition. No? So, well, that's that's it, and I, I try to be as, as fast as possible just to open the space for, for discussion. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, though ITF doesn't directly deal with spectrum, but this is a very important topic and that's why we thought that this discussion here and as part of this workshop is pretty good. And we already have a question from Luis. So Luis, go ahead. Thanks, Rup. Uh, thanks, Raquel, for this, uh, as you say, position paper. Uh, as I was saying in the chat, the uh, most of regulators around the world, they just deny the use of exterior use of the six gigahertz band in the, the on non-licensed mode. So, from my point of view, this brings no social benefit, even if they claim IMT is going to have a huge impact in in in, in society. However, the uh, where do you feel is the the, the the forum if if it exists? to discuss these issues because we know ITU, WRC, or the, um, the Conference for Telecommunications Development has have not been very receptive or at least very active in, in changing this uh, idea, which is still a, a large number of regulators around the world are not decided on the uh, whole use of the six gigahertz band. Yeah, um, it was not in the in the final uh, regulations or any. Uh, you won't see it in the documentation from the conference, but I can already tell you that the things do not look good for twenty seven because we had the majority, I would say like 90% of the Southeast Asian countries, they wanted to be uh, included as the parts who demanded uh, part of the six gigahertz to be identified for IMT use, for licensed use. Since it was a last minute uh, request, it was not accepted for 23, but it will be something very relevant. And the same, with many Latin American countries, and I would say um, at least half of the African countries as well. So um, I don't. I think that uh, there is a need uh, because I mean we, we cannot just say that it's all about commercial interest. That you know uh, there are promises coming from one industry, and all regulators from the global south are just saying yes. No, it's a little bit more complex than that. So I think that there there are some. Uh, ways that we, are, we need to work together. I think that we need to expand it uh, beyond the, as you mentioned, no, beyond the, 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 the traditional indigenous people, um, uh, community networks, no, this small, uh, small scale, because the threats that we're going to face, it's going to affect everyone and not only the, the small communities, no. So, yeah, uh, what you mentioned, it's something that basically it's uh, nowadays, I would say that only the US has uh, the FCC is the only one who's openly saying that they're against the use of the six gigahertz for for IMT for now, but they're getting more and more isolated now with, with this idea. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that the uh, maybe Canada and Mexico will be carried uh, out in that uh, decision. Yes, maybe Canada less, but the. Uh, I'm sure Mexico is going to follow the nearly the same steps as, as in the US. Yeah, unfortunately, it was like this exchange of, um, so I give you one thing, you give me another thing. And in this exchange, the US wanted Mexico to support uh, one decision and it was not that. So Brazil and Mexico uh, are listed in the footnote as countries who decided that part of the six gigahertz, the upper part could be, uh, the target of, of studies, no, for IMT identification already for the WRC 23. Thank you. Thanks. Arnold, go ahead with your clarifying yeah, question. Very quick, uh, it's interesting. Uh, in this, in this uh, so you were in WRC, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, have you noticed so the, uh, is there any kind of assessment on the battle of Wi-Fi school versus 5G, 6G school? I'm sorry, the Wi-Fi versus? Wi-Fi versus 5G slash 6G. Yes, yes. Uh, it, of course, they don't talk about it directly in terms of, of technologies. And this, for me, it's one, one issue, no? 
because since yeah. you you have the industry there, but who uh, the only member states uh, member states can take the microphone and, and make decisions. Yeah. So they don't make decisions on technologies, no, because that would be a little bit weird. But um, it is a pity because they don't. Uh, by doing that, you don't have a focus in terms of tech diversity because this is something that it's important, no, in general. We had the entry of the the the, the leave, uh, that you know it's 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 very important in this in the connectivity as the previous colleague showed already, but beside that, we don't have much discussion in terms of tech diversity there, and uh, unfortunately the, the the representatives of the industry who actually bring this tech diversity they are too small, to be, you know, present there. Now, how can you compete to with countries who actually have their main representative from the industry. No, it's, yeah. it's very difficult. I, I am at the ITU, so I, I completely understand what you said. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And now let's move to open discussion. And we have Maria as our first person in the queue. Go ahead, Maria. I just want to add some thoughts to um, pick up the discussion, maybe. So, um, you know, I think maybe one take very kind of. <laughs> completely unknown thing, but like a takeaway for me is beside kind of any kind of financial challenges with community networks about like people who are connected and cannot afford um, other connection or people who maintain and manage these networks or set up the networks and are, um, you know, have problems getting hardware or, or depend on like getting um, hardware uh, uh, gifted to them and so on. I think the, the other topic that I heard a lot of was about the management gap and that is about um, best practices, um, exchanging information about building expertise or also time, getting time of people who already have the expertise and getting them involved. Um, and uh, the one thing I'm, I'm wondering about this is besides, for example, the training ISOG is doing and, and Jane pointed out in the chat, are there kind of things that the technical community can do here? Um, and then the other question is also the other thought I have on my mind is also, is this also because the internet got like much more complex and that's much harder now to actually just get connected? Um, and is that something we also need to consider when we're designing the, the internet? So just like to start off the discussion. Now that's a very good, uh, like your starting discussion. Uh, feel free to queue up if folks wants to add on their thoughts or reply to one of the discussion topics that's been posted uh, here as well. Uh, Mallory, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, those are all really good questions, Maria. It's also kind of what I'm thinking about too. Um, and also to strengthen the work that's already ongoing in this community from Gaia. Um, you know, there's been a lot of really interesting presentations that run the gamut from measurement to actual like implementations. I think I remember vividly one about like cantinas or like walks being used to um, deliver wireless connectivity. I think it was in Indonesia, maybe. Anyway, it's been years. But Gaia has present like the folks at Gaia have presented on a really wide range of things, including what I said before about GiphyNet's financial um, platform. I, if I think back, I think that's actually where I learned about it. Um, so, you know, folks came to the IETF and they didn't talk about how they built the network. They talked about how they sort of deal with the monetization of it on the back end, because that's such a critical piece. So, like we're getting all of this transmission, not to use um, a pun, but like in the IETF, but that's not necessarily resulting in you know, changes to our specifications or new areas of work. And I guess I wonder, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's worth actually thinking through um, some of these questions, you know, I think in particular I directed at Marwan earlier, where it's like, but well, what's the, if we separate out the market issue, which we can't really deal with in the IETF. We don't want to deal with it. What are the real constituent pieces of the technical problem? And where does that work happen? Does it happen, you know, in a dedicated group to think about how best to deliver content to the last mile? This I'm thinking about Peng's awesome presentation on how you could use like machine learning methods or other things to kind of actually suggest where do you place this next piece of infrastructure to reach more the most people rather than letting the market decide. Um, does that happen in a dedicated group on, co on community networks or does that happen in working groups? Um, and I'm not actually sure that the latter is possible because I, I don't think 
that there are working groups that actually consider uh, these particular use cases and and that may be a, a fail point, right? That could be speaking to the <laughs> distributed internet research group where we're talking about the bad effects of consolidation and centralization. I think that means that we're leaving out these corner cases. And, and I'll just finish with one more example. Um, Webpack was, um, I think it was just a buff. I don't know that it ever, was it a working group? Anyway, it no longer exists. It was, it was somewhat short-lived. I think one of the, um, towards the end of that work, when folks were really trying to make a case for why it was important to do, somebody brought up the use case for uh, community networks, being able to deliver whole web pages in a sort of asynchronous, you know, low latency environment. And it just, nobody really bought that as uh, the actual use case. Cause you know, this proposal, this proposed work was coming from a really big tech company that didn't necessarily have these constraints. And I think they were sort of using community networks as like, I don't know, maybe an excuse or an imaginary for why this would be useful work, but it wasn't coming from the folks who are actually building these sort of low latency, uh, living and working in these low latency environments. So I feel like there will be more interesting work, but it needs to sort of come from this community to actually be implemented and to be useful. So I'm just troubling whether or not we shouldn't be talking specifically about how to strengthen Gaia with specific areas of, of work um, to answer Mary's question. Thanks. Yeah, I think this role of uh, IRTF and role of Gaia, like it's very important. Like part of the ITF where I am at, where one question or one comment that you usually hear, community networks are at the end networks. And the way we write most of our stuff, like especially in the lower layers, are meant to work on all scales of uh, networks, small networks to large networks. And they usually do. So most of the uh, gaps we see is more on the management sites and the operation sites. And we have very good operational practices for all type of networks. Maybe in ITF, we don't have very good documented things on how to run community networks better and what are the good practices. And that's the gap we definitely see right away. Uh, I see Arnold, uh, go ahead. And I also look at time, we have eight minutes. So everybody please keep their comments short and let's hear from more people. Arnold, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, I must say that before uh, this bias workshop started, so when I prepared, I, I had no idea that, even about the term CN, so it's quite uh, good for me. So my point is about, uh, to echo on Yaya, about is the internet more complex? It's not only is the internet more complex, but the internet is much more dangerous. And I could see the theme of security coming in a couple of places in the various uh, presentations so far. That's all for, for that point. The other point is about um, the, the issue of uh, corporate responsibility here. And, and that's, that's one that, that probably even corporate, big corporate don't, are not equipped to actually organize themselves around that. So there is no program or no, no real model for how they could set up a program for corporate responsibility for this particular one. That's it. Thanks. Marvin, go ahead. Oh, I just took myself out of the queue. It's, it's a, it's a quick one. I, th I think there's a couple of good points here. One is, um, I, I will point out having participated in, 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 in this community as well. Um, and even here at the, at the CDN, we talk to technical people and, and we, and we sit and we debate, what are the big challenges that lie ahead? And, and anecdotally people joke and say, well, it's layer eight. These are all layer eight problems. And the first time I heard it, I stopped to think, what? what? And then and you realize it's the users, it's the, it's the people. Um, I'm much more optimistic, and I think there are economic models, um, and there are sort of uh, governance models and all of the rest that can actually promote and, and, and flourish, help CNs to flourish. Maybe they're just not well understood or they're not well recognized by, you know, regulators, corporate entities, whatever the case may be, but they do exist. How that fits in the ITF, I'm not sure, speaking to Mallory's point. On the flip side, I think Dhruv does raise a good point, which is one of the things that is clear is that knowledge dissemination is much harder than it should be. And mm. maybe a starting point is a set of best practices published by the ITF that talk about some of the simple places to start. Um, 
because there are people out there who want to do it. They just have no idea where to begin. And even finding the other resources is, is already a big step, especially when you have limited connectivity to begin with. Thanks, Bhavan. We have a comment from Vesna. Vesna wants to highlight that there is a group uh, e-impact, which is an IAB program, which is discussing aspects of sustainability for community networks. That could be something to discuss there. And second point, cooperative green energy providers as part of autonomous CN development in the future. That's again uh, a comment from Vesna. Moving ahead, we have Lewis in the queue. Go ahead, Lewis. Thanks, Drup. And I agree with uh, um, Mallory about the uh, the role of Gaia in into these discussions. Yes, and as you know, Gaia is. Um, it's a nice forum for uh, discussing uh, community networks issue, but I feel, as Marwan was saying, the, uh, the, there's a lot of need in the in the community for knowledge, and this means the uh, many areas of IETF need to provide uh, resources to these networks that may not look so attractive as the large networks, and it doesn't mean that people in these networks have no needs and uh, have their needs solved. Actually, the, the lack of knowledge uh, is a big problem. And if IETF doesn't take the lead, I hardly see uh, people in a fast way to solve their problems. Thanks. Thank you. Arnold, go ahead. Yeah, I have a second one that really uh, struck me here is how hard it is to connect the dots between what we're trying to do here with the SDGs themselves. I, I think it's the non-trivial one because the SDG, somebody said, it's not about communication and that's, I never thought about it. That's a good remark. And how do we map the, the correctly, I mean, mathematically the, the dots here, I, I, I think it should be on the to-do list or the parking lot list. Thank you. Thanks. Mallory? Uh, just to add to the growing list of reasons why this work should happen in the IETF community more broadly, IRTF, IETF inclusive. Um, one is that, um, as folks had said, that um, there are real challenges to uh, community networks. I think, Marwan, you were listing them. One that I felt like should be on that list is uh, competition and sort of corporate hostility. Um, I know that it's just community networks are not on the market to compete and to eat the world and to be hugely successful, right? They just want to exist, but it's really hard in a, an environment where, you know, you get either the incumbents who don't want the community network as a competitor or even in places that don't have an incumbent, right? You're literally providing access that no one has provided before. You then quote, open the market. And then the sort of incumbent or the nearest big tech company moves in to take over your market and the community network dissolves. So I think by um, because because the ITF is a place where industry comes to cooperate on how things should work at their best, irrespective of these market dynamics, it gives community networks some help, right? Some help with like actually uh, running the tech in a, in a sort of non hostile environment. And then related to that, a second thing is that it helps build relationships. So like the proposal to have either um, work with the um, upstream providers or uh, over the top services, content delivery, um, that sort of thing. It, those kinds of relationships are built at places like the IECF, uh, not, in a, not in an antitrust issue kind of way, but in a, in a really like, I know you now and I can call you up and now we can figure out some kind of um, way to partner. That I think increasingly is a, you know, possible possible outcome for that. I wanted those two things to ref be reflected in the notes. Uh, Peng, you have the last comment. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I have um, great points made by uh, um, from the discussions here. I agree with Louis' point that uh, IETF has done a lot of great, um, you know, um, work on the uh, community networks over the years. But I think if you're going forward, there's still a lot of technical challenges that could be shareable among those community networks using satellites or, or not. So, for example, machine learning uh, methods, they're going to be a generalizable machine learning method that could be uh, 
provide it to those community networks as a tool. So we need a lot of knowledge building and some of te technical development towards that end that could, uh, you know, uh, you know, benefit from the IETF's leadership on doing that going forward. Um, and another uh, comment I, I wanted to make is that the mapping from uh, Arnold, uh, the mapping from between community networks uh, or uh, to the SDG goals. I myself have uh, had that question as well, but I, I found one good though. That there is no clear mapping right now, but uh, that's why I mentioned, uh, you know, doing that is you know providing better community networks is the way to accelerate implementations of SDGs. Uh, although there's some clear uh, mapping right here, but there, yeah, we can develop the more clear uh, mapping for clarifying uh, towards our objectives and, and the things that we're doing around the community networks. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thanks for everyone for a very good discussion today. We had a good set of presentations, good discussion afterwards. Let's continue this on day two. Uh, see you tomorrow. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Bye.